Welcome once again to Heart of the Shepherd as we continue our chronological study of the scriptures. Now, our devotional today is begins with the word warning, and the title is The Faith and Fate of a Nation is Never More Than One Generation from Extinction. 2 Kings 13 and 2 Chronicles 24 are the studies for today's scripture. Well, our chronological study then does continue, but the focus of this devotional will be 2 Chronicles 24. Now, we've already considered some of the events that are going to be found in this passage uh, in our earlier study of 2 Kings chapter 12. Of course, 2 Kings was authored before the Babylonian captivity, while 2 Chronicles is believed to have been written by Ezra after the children of Israel returned from exile. Well, let's begin looking at the reign of Joash, 2 Chronicles chapter 24. Now, 2 Chronicles 24 details the years that Joash reigned as king of Judah. Now, you might remember that he began reigning as a seven-year-old and was under, under the spiritual tutelage of the high priest named Jehoiada. Now, we're also reminded that the king did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada, the priest, chapter 24 and verse 2. Now, there is also the record that Jehoiada had taken for Joash two wives, and he begat sons and daughters, again, verse 3. And then Joash, you will notice in verses 6 through 14, repaired the temple. Again, we saw this in 2 Kings chapter 12. And so Joash did command the Levites to begin to repair the temple. Now, you might remember the temple had fallen into disrepair, actually uh, had been uh, abused by Athaliah, the queen grandmother it would have been for Joash. So Joash commanded the temple to be repaired. And unfortunately, the Levites were not as zealous about repairing the temple as the king. And so we read in chapter 24 and verse 5 that the Levites hastened it not. Well, the cause of the necessity for repairing the temple are stated as well in these words. For the sons of Athaliah, that wicked woman, had broken up the house of God. And also all the things dedicated, uh, or all the dedicated things of the house of the Lord did they bestow upon Balaam. Verse 7. Now, we're not given the identity of the sons of Athaliah. Uh, however, they followed the wicked queen's disdain for the Lord. They stripped the temple and furnished Baal's temple with its treasures. Well, the means of collecting the monies to rebuild the temple and pay its workers was recorded in verses 8 through 12. Now, there was enough, we read, given by the people to not only set the house of God in order and finish it, but also to make new vessels of gold and silver for offering sacrifices in verse 14. And so once again, we're reminded how Athelia and her generation tried to eradicate the Lord and the worship of the Lord and even abuse the building by disfiguring it, taking from uh, the temple, the treasures, and taking it over to the house of Baal that they had built for that idol god. Well, we come to verse 15 through 16, and here we have recorded the death of Jehoiada, the high priest. Now, incredibly, according to the scriptures here, he lived 130 years. Now, what a wonderful, rich life and ministry this servant of the Lord lived. Now, we might uh, ask the question, why? How, how, how could it be that a man like this could live 130 years? Well, I would say a lot has to do with what his ministry was to uh, Judah and particularly to the young king Jehoash. And so the Lord obviously providentially and lovingly extended the life of the high priest. Now, his testimony, we read in Israel, was such that he was given a burial worthy of kings in chapter 24 and verse 16. And yet, the death of the high priest became the catalyst 
for some in authority to depart from worshiping the Lord and return to their wicked, idolatrous ways. You find that recorded in verse 17. And so I want to consider a warning at this point, and it is this, that the faith of a people and nation is never more than one generation from extinction. Now, I say that because we can find it obviously recorded here. Here's the high priest that lived 130 years, and yet when he perished, what did the nation do? It turned away from the Lord and back to worshiping idols. Well, understand that our world and our nations are no different, and particularly those of you that are citizens of the United States. We have been watching for, well, I guess a half century, a rejection of the historic biblical roots of these United States. And so it's no wonder that in the year 2024, we find we're living in a pagan society, a, 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 a nation whose leaders have rejected and rebelled against God. They've rejected his law and his commandments. They have no desire to hear the gospel. And as a result of that, we're watching our nation decay and fail. May that stir you not to be depressed, but stir you to realize that we need voices in this day that are faithful and true to God and to his word. Well, continuing our study, I want you to notice in verses 17 through 18 that the catalyst of this departure and rejection of the Lord was a petition for liberty. Soon after then, Jehoiada's death, the leaders of Judah courted Joash's favor. And the king, we read, hearkened unto them. They came to him. They made a plea to him. And he listened to them. You see, Jehoiada's presence in Judah, it had been a powerful one. And its influence upon King Joash began when he was little more than an infant. And the king, throughout Jehoiada's life, faithfully served the Lord under the shadow and guidance of the high priest. But his death revealed the weak spiritual state of the king and leaders of Judah. You know, I have watched that over and over again in our nation, in our churches, in our Bible colleges. The movement, the replacement, the death of men who have been spiritual leaders in a generation their death is often the catalyst for the new generation to actually reject the old. Oh, they don't do it outright, but they do. They reject the precepts. They reject the spiritual disciplines of the generation before them. And as a result of that, I believe you'll see again and again that God removes his blessing. Well, tragically then, we read that the leaders of Judah, and I quote, left the house, literally the temple of the Lord God of their fathers. In verse 17, and what did they do? They returned to their idols and their wicked, immoral practices. You see mentioned here the groves that were used not only for idol worship, but they were also known historically to be places of prostitution in the name of religion. And so it goes that one nation rejects as the spiritual piety of the nation before, or the generation before them, and they embrace sin and wickedness under the guise of liberty. Well, what did they do? They provoked the Lord. And we read in verse 18 that he poured out his wrath upon Judah and Jerusalem for their trespass. You see, our God is long suffering and he is patient, but only for a season because God is also a God of justice. And his justice demands that he do that and demand that which is holy. Now what follows in this passage is sadly instructive and I think all too familiar in our day. Notice in verses 19 through 22 that a tolerance for wickedness bred an intolerance of faithful prophets. Here's what we find then. Though the leaders rejected the Lord, he, the Lord, though, nevertheless sent prophets. And what did they do? Those prophets called Judah to repent. 
And yet we read in 2 Chronicles 24 and verse 19, but they would not give ear. Well, then we read again, the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, who was the son of Jehoiada the priest, which stood above the people. And we read of Zechariah that he said unto the people, Thus saith God, why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord, that ye cannot prosper? Verse 20, because ye have forsaken the Lord, he hath also forsaken you. You know, I look at the world that we live in and I realize that not even the churches have a tolerance for men that speak the truth with boldness and power. Instead, they want to soft pedal gospel and grace. Well, there is the, the wonderful truth of the message of the gospel and certainly God's word gives us grace. But I'm reminded that when you reject God's law and commandments, you really have no desire for God's grace and for you become a judge of yourself and judging yourself by others. And so Zechariah was raised up of God to warn the nation, why? Why reject the Lord and then not prosper? And then because you've forsaken the Lord, he's forsaken you. Well, how did the leaders of Judah respond to the preaching of Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada? Did King Joash remember the spiritual lessons of his mentor, Jehoiada? Did he humble himself and call upon the leaders to return to the Lord and the temple? I know exactly the opposite. Tragically, we read in verse 21 that they conspired against Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada. And they stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. How swiftly Joash forgot the influence of a godly mentor like Jehoiada to the point that he even had his son slain. Well, even King Joash, who enjoyed the love and mentoring of Zechariah's father then, we read in verse 22, he remember not the kindness which Jehoiada, his father, had done to him. And he slew his son. Well, Zechariah was dying. He rebuked the king and he said, the Lord look upon it and require it. What does that mean? That God would avenge Zechariah's murder. Well, verses 23 through 27, we find that God's judgment did indeed fall upon the king and the leaders of Judah. At the end of that same year in which Zechariah was murdered, a Syrian army laid siege to Jerusalem and killed the leaders and took the spoils of Jerusalem to the king of Damascus, verse 23. You see, Judah's lust for sin and the depravity of its leaders left the nation so weakened that a mere small company of men, we read, was all that was necessary for Syria to conquer a very great host. In other words, the army of Syria was much smaller than Israel or Judah and Jerusalem. But nevertheless, without God's blessing, it took only a small number to defeat a great army. You see, in verse 24, the people had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers, and he used their enemies to weaken and execute judgment against Joash. Well, a closing thought. The glorious 40-year reign of Joash came to an inglorious end. The king suffered, we read, great diseases, we're not told what they were, until his own servants conspired against him for shedding the blood of the sons of Jehoiada, the priest, and they slew him on his bed. Well, unlike the honorable burial that Jehoiada, the priest, was given, which was worthy of a king, Joash was not even buried in the sepulchers of the kings. And so I close. Why is a knowledge of history essential? Well, it is this. When we grasp and understand the simple ways of men and nations that have gone before us, we know the provocation of God's wrath when a nation and its leaders reject the Lord, his law, and commandments. Judah and her leaders despise the prophets, and they silence them, and her enemies spoiled her treasures. You know, the history of the world is littered with the ruins of empires that fell to their enemies. 
because they despise the warnings of God's prophet. Well, some would say the chickens came home to roost for Joash, but perhaps a better way of saying that is Galatians 6 and verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Look around at your world and look at your nation. And do you see God's blessing or do you instead see his judgment? May God help us that we, his people, will be faithful and true until we, like Jehoiada, draw our last breath. Well, God bless you. Thank you for being a part of this heart of a shepherd. Bye-bye.